The Pythagorean theorem is, certainly in Waldorf schools, one of the, I think, one of the highlights of the mathematics curriculum. You know, we really look at this historically, philosophically, can be introduced anywhere between sixth and seventh grade, typically. Um, I have a main lesson that I teach in 10th grade that really, uh, this is the centerpiece of it. And we, we go and we look at how Pythagoras may have done it. We look at the school of Pythagoras and, and really look at their philosophy and what all of this meant to them. Well, this book says this. The book on the first page, of course, what does it have on the first page? It says, what is it? No, oh, come on. Pythagorean theorem. It's like a knee-jerk reaction. You know, like someone hits you in the knee, Pythagorean theorem, and you should say a squared plus b squared equals c squared, right? Right? The Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, right? It's interesting to note, of course, that uh, the Pythagorean theorem, you know, typically the drawing in any textbook looks like this, right? And then they say a squared plus b squared equals c squared. It's very interesting to note that if you'd come up to, if you could somehow magically go back in time and say, whoa, I really want to meet Pythagoras, and you go up to him and you go, hey, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, <laughs> he would think you were weird, probably for many reasons, but <laughs> he, he wouldn't recognize this. He didn't see it as an algebraic formula at all. In fact, algebra, in terms of development of algebraic notation, doesn't come along for 2,500 years. So it means nothing to him. And in fact, even the drawing here, would mean almost nothing to him. Well, he would see it further, put it that way. He would be able to visualize here the squares. See, a squared for us just meant an exponent. Whatever that length was, square it. But for him and for the ancient Greeks, it was the area of a square, a physical square that was attached to the side. And if we take this, it's one of the uglier squares I've ever drawn. This one may be worse. For him, it was all about the area of these two squares here. Those two squares would combine to be equal to the area of that square. For example, if you were a farmer, and these were your fields. This had to be a right triangle, of course. And if you had three fields, then the amount of rice you could grow in these two fields combined would be equal to the amount of rice you could grow here. The area of this square plus the area of this square equals the area of that square. The area of the a squared plus the area of the b squared equals the area of the c squared. It's a very different way of looking at it. And so what do you see in the textbook? Well, they give you the formula. And what are they immediately doing? They're immediately giving you examples of how to solve triangles. Oh, if this is 3 and that's 4, this is the typical one, right? 3, 4, you remember this? It would then be 5, right? If this were 5 and that were 12, there was another magical Pythagorean triple. And they are magical. 5, 12, and that would have to then be 13 to make it work. So you solve. And the Pythagorean theorem is very powerful. You use it to solve all kinds of triangles all through the rest of your years of math education. It's an important thing to know how to solve these triangles. But the sad thing is, is they begin with it immediately. And what I find interesting, and I think several textbooks do this, this particular textbook, at the beginning of each unit, had to convince you why in the world you would want to learn this. And so what do they do? They have a little box. And what does the box say? It says what you'll learn. And then after that, it says, if that's not enough, it had a box that said why it's important, which is kind of sad, because otherwise, I think they're worried that if they didn't include that there, people would think that it wasn't important or something. So what you'll learn. And so what did it say in the box for the Pythagorean theorem, what you'll learn? It said. You'll learn to solve, or is it? You'll, you'll learn to use the Pythagorean theorem to solve problems. OK. No, I mean, it's fair enough, right? This is the good one, though. Now, why it's important. This is real. I'm, I'm, I wish I was joking, right? You can use the Pythagorean theorem to solve problems. This is why it's important. You can use the Pythagorean theorem to solve problems involving sailing and travel. 
I had to read it three times. I'm like, really? <laughs> Sailing and travel. Like, who made that up? Right? It was very strange, right? And then they had a picture of a sailboat next to it. And you know what it really was weird? And this is, this is, I'm sorry, but this was just poor. You know, I don't know. And I actually think the authors of these textbooks, they don't make all the problems up. I'm convinced of that. They're paying someone else to make the problems up and to fill in the little boxes about, because no author of any textbook, I hope, would ever say that's why the Pythagorean theorem is important. Right? And so they have a picture of a sailboat, and I was thinking, well, that could be a really interesting problem, couldn't it? You know, sailing around the world and measuring, think of all the triangles you get. No. They were measuring the, they were measuring the dimensions of the sail. It was a triangular sail. I was like, oh, OK. Pythagorean theorem. I already gave a little bit about what makes it different, thinking of it really geometrically. You know, I think it's really sad that it's all been reduced to an algebraic formula. You know? So how can we really get into making it something that's actually really interesting and curious and alive? Um, so I'm going to show you a proof very quickly of the Pythagorean theorem that I give in 10th grade. And this is a proof given by uh, Hermann von Baravalle from the first Waldorf school. And so it actually starts with this basic idea that if I have two parallel lines and I have a rectangle, let's take this rectangle right here, and I slice this rectangle into several little sections here, that actually if I wanted to, I could push, you can think of it as a stack of cards. And I could push over the top and have it go slanted a bit. How'd I do there? Eh, it's not so bad. And so these pink slices are meant to be the same as what the yellow ones originally were, right? And so what does that tell me? It tells me the area of, if you remember what this thing is called, that was a rectangle because it, had, it was intended to be. It had all right angles. And so now what I've done is I've slid it over, and that's called a parallelogram, right? And either way, if the original rectangle had a base of, say, four inches and the height was three, the area of the rectangle would be 12 square inches. And the parallelogram, what I know, is the thing that's important is this distance from here to here, this height, which is, of course, also 3. And so the area of the parallelogram, because I can actually transform, do you see all these infinitely thin slices? I can just imagine pushing them back to be a rectangle. And so the area of the parallelogram equals the area of the rectangle. Did that make sense? You know, the area of both are the same, because the strips are all the same. I just moved it over. Yeah? So I'm going to show you a proof using this of why the Pythagorean theorem is true. So we start out with, I think I can do it here. We start out with that situation. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the bottom. Now, instead of here, I took the top and moved it over. I'm, instead, I'm going to take the green one. I'm going to take the bottom and slide it over like that. Did that make sense? So I have two parallel lines that are here. Right? And I'm going to move the bottom over like that. And then I'm going to take the red one, and I'm going to imagine the parallel lines going vertically. So I'm going to take the left of this and slide it down a little bit. Do you see that? And what I'm going to get are two parallelograms that have equal area from the original squares. Yeah? How does that look? Yeah? Does that work? OK, so this green square has the same area of this green parallelogram. It's a very stretched out parallelogram. And this red square got stretched downwards, and it is equal in area to that red parallelogram. And now I'm going to take that, and I'm going to slide the whole thing into place up here. Yeah? So I just kind of picked it up and slid it up there. Now, of course, you can ask, and it's a very good question, and in 10th grade, any 10th grader is going to look at that and go, OK, really? Why do you know it fits? But an eighth grader typically is not going to ask that. The eighth grader is going to go, oh, look, it looks like it fits. Good enough for me. And that's all right, right? They're in a different place developmentally, so it's actually OK. In the tenth grader, we really analyze it, 
And then the last thing I'm going to do, you can see that we now have parallel lines kind of going at a slant, right? And so now I'm going to kind of go with my hand and hit that corner and knock all those lines, all the red and green lines, up into the final square. Yeah? And there it is. Yeah? To me, this captures the imagination and the essence of you know, a question that should live. The first thing the student, you know, a student really should sit there and go, well, how do you know that's true? How did Pythagoras, Pythagoras had a very different proof, by the way. And in 10th grade, through a main lesson, that's what we do. The first, one of the first things we do, we look at six different proofs of the Pythagorean theorem. That's one of them. Yeah? And we look at a total of six, and then we analyze them. And we look at, well, which one's a better proof? Well, it depends what you're looking for. For a seventh grader, this is better. For an eighth grader, this is, you know. And so we look at them all, and then finally, which proof would be the, the perfect proof? Because Euclid was in search of the perfect proof. And what was that? Which of the six proofs would be good enough for Euclid? And the answer is none of them. He's way too picky. And then the whole rest of the next few weeks is trying to see, well, how did Euclid did it? And he went way over the top with this really elaborate proof. Yeah? But you're building it up historically and philosophically, and then the Pythagorean, has, Pythagorean theorem has real meaning. It's not just some random formula seemingly pulled out of a hat.